We in, are in a world where things are changing rapidly. So, uh, so we've gathered four representatives, reward directors, um, heads of reward, head of employee experience and brand from big companies that have gone through major change in recent years for one reason or another. So to introduce them first, and then they're gonna tell us about their organization, what change they've gone through, and how that's perhaps changed their reward offering. So on the far side, in the green top, is Jane Hubbers Humberston, no, no, and not. she... No. Gemma. 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 And I wrote it up here as well, I wrote Gemma Green. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so Gemma Lee, who is Head of Employee Experience and Brand at Konica Minolta. Then next to her is the Director of Global Reward and Mobility at Jaguar Land Rover. And then we've got Julia Clement, who's Head of Reward at Skyscanner. And then closest to me is JC von Freda, Head of Reward at Wellcome Trust. But I'm going to start with Gemma, which is why I got confused earlier. <laughs> and if you can talk about Chronica Minolta and the journey that you've been on as a company and then in terms of your reward, please. Yeah, sure. So um, Chronica Minolta traditionally uh, was a print manufacturer and also um, optic-based technologies. And um, pretty much over the last nearly 10 years, uh, I suppose, we've... Um, transformed into an IT services company. And I say transformed like the journey's over, but it's an ongoing um, evolution. So um, you can imagine the scale of change that that involves with a company that previously sold physical product and had a sales force that was structured to do so as well as had a reward and commission structure that aligned to a traditional manufacturing background as well as service engineers in the field servicing physical product. There is so much change that's gone on in, in Konica Minolta in, in the last decade and continues to happen. Um, <coughs> as a global company, it's uh, around 47,000 employees um, in countries all over the world with the um, head office and centre in, in Japan. Um, and in the UK, it's an employee base of just over 1,000. And as I say, the, the changes internally have been changes to processes, changes to technology, changes to people, skills, capabilities our performance management structure, our reward structure. So every possible company change is taking place and continues to. And it's a, a constant um, challenge, if I'm honest. I think that one of the things um, when I've been at lots of events like this and, and speaking is to often I hear a lot of people talk about everything being absolutely brilliant and that we do this with employee experience or we do this with internal comms or performance management or reward and recognition. And I think that Conor Camelta does some absolutely brilliant things, but we are constantly facing into challenges because the pace of technology and change is moving faster than almost all of our people can cope with, particularly, particularly those that have come on the journey with us and come from our more traditional background. So I would say that one of our biggest challenges right now is around reward and how we move that forward with our work, people, all the people in our workplace, and we make it relevant to all. So Jane, what's happening at Jaguar Land Rover? Oh, quite a lot, really. So I guess everybody probably familiar with our brands and um, knows who we are, so I don't need to spend too much time on that. Um, we are the largest investor in the UK in terms of automotive um, R&D and engineering. We have around 9,000 engineers and designers in the UK. Um, headquartered in the UK, we have about 38,000 employees um, globally, with the majority in the UK, um, but increasingly overseas, so not so long ago. Um, our only people outside the UK were in sort of national sales companies, um, but increasingly now we have manufacturing plants around the world, so China, Slovakia, Brazil, India, um, and also more recently engineering presence um, around the world. So we've recently set up hubs in Hungary, in Ireland, in the US, um, so really beginning to sort of become much more international. Um, I guess in the sort of last 10 years, um, we've had massive growth. So from really 2010 to 17, um, really huge growth, largely um, triggered through growth in China and sort of increasing um, product lines. Um, so during that time, we hired 28,000 people. So it really was massive growth. Um, and in that time, we really had to grow up as a business, I guess. I think often talk about it as a bit like an adolescent we, we everybody assumes we're sort of all grown up and know what we're doing but actually we've we've grown up so fast 
um, we're really not that mature at all in terms of our basic fundamentals. So a lot of work in terms of process, governance, being much clearer about accountabilities because you can't just rely on relationships anymore. So a lot of change in that regard. Clearly, the automotive business is going through massive transformation at the moment um, in terms of electrification, connected car, autonomous vehicles. So big change in skills requirements for our workforce. Um, we're having to compete for talent with you know, completely different um, sources than we would have done in the past. So that's really testing our reward structure. Um, we have quite a traditional um, sort of one size fits all, quite hierarchical, grade driven um, entitlement structure and that's really kind of creaking at the seams. Um, but it's how do you make the changes without upsetting the whole apple cart is really quite tricky. Um, and then also to get the skills, we, that's partly why we're growing outside of the UK because we're having to go where the skills are. We can't get it all to come to leafy Warwickshire. Um, so a lot of work in my team in terms of you know, setting up new reward structures in all sorts of countries around the world. And then I guess the final piece I would say is um, you know, we've clearly, and it's been very much reported in the press, had a very challenging 18 months. Um, a lot of political and economic uncertainty around the world impacting um, the sales of our products um, at the same time as having to invest hugely in all of the future technology. So we've had a major cost reduction programme. We've lost about 5,000 people um, in the last 12 months, so really reeling from that period of uncertainty and organisation change. So a lot of our focus now is really about re-engaging the workforce, creating that vision for the future and confidence and building on employee experience is our major focus right now. Julia. So uh, I'm Julia Clement and I work for Skyscanner, which I'm assuming or hoping everybody has used <laughs> to look for flights and hotels. Um, Skyscanner started in 2003 when our chairman, our now chairman, decided that he was spending way too much time looking for, you know, on 15 different websites, looking for cheap flights to go skiing. Um, and so he started a website that allowed everybody to look for cheap flights, um, really with the ethos of a customer first, partner second, so the airlines and, and OTAs and, and Skyscanner third. And that's something that is you know, inbuilt within our, our culture. So we've grown considerably since the three people in, a, in a, an attic room in Leith in Edinburgh. And in 2016, we uh, were, were acquired for £1.4 billion pounds by C-Trip, uh, one of the largest travel companies based out of, mm -hmm. out of China. So a lot of the change that we've seen is not only sort of becoming owned by a, a larger company, albeit that we've run very independently, We've also, since I joined three years ago, we've doubled in size, so we've got 1,500 employees across eight different locations. And that really is a, to the same, on a much lesser scale, <laughs> to your numbers, mm -hmm. but, but in terms of the same very rapid growth and uh, the need for more process rather than knowing exactly who you talk to about which bit of code which um, you're trying to, to do something to. Uh, Earlier this year, and to the to following on from the Patagonia conversation, we actually launched a new mission, which was to lead the global transformation to modern and sustainable travel, which actually is a which really resonated with our employees. Um, to the, the point about purpose in this, I find that really interesting. I think the um, we have an average age of 32. You know, we have 80% uh, of our population is Gen Y. And we have pretty much 80% of our population as software engineers in an incredibly competitive space, not just against the Facebook and Googles of this world now, but against every company. And so it's a really uh, challenging area to be in from an attraction and retention point of view. And then JC, a very different experience, a very different organization. Tell us more about the Welcome Trust. Uh, Will, thank you. Um, so uh, Welcome Trust, what and most of you wouldn't know unless you're uh, in medical uh, research. We are a, one of the largest charitable foundations in the world funding medical research. And 
we've gone through a lot of change. And that started about 15 years ago when we hired a chief investment officer um, to look after our portfolio or our fund. Uh, we are financially independent because we had a nice pot of money that uh, we were trying to, to manage the best possible way. And we got somebody from Goldman Sachs, and, uh, which was controversial at the time in our world. And um, he's done a great job. He's done an amazing job. So he took the, the fund, which was uh, a few billion pounds, to about 26 billion pounds uh, this year. And at the time of, you know, you may have remember, there was a crisis, I think, at the end of the 2000s, uh, financial crisis, which was the biggest in living memory. But the fund has performed extremely well. And what it has given us is firepower beyond what we could have imagined 20 years ago. So instead of, you know, giving a few millions, a few hundreds of millions, we are giving a billion pounds a year to fund medical research in the world. So we've got 14,000 researchers globally who are doing amazing work in genomics, um, you know, against uh, cancer and neuroscience and so on. So um, somebody said in the movie, with great powers come great responsibilities. And um, we had to deal with a lot of influx of requests to, to fund. And we were not very professional about it. So over the last yeah, five years, we've doubled in size. We now have 800 people. Uh, we've structured the organization differently to be able to accommodate some of the biggest challenges out there. So you talk, you talk about drug resistance infection. It's as big in our mind as climate change because there are massive issues uh, overall, not just with humans, but also animals. Um, vaccines. So thanks to the work we've done in the last few years, um, we've been able to have two vaccines deployed on the, f on the ground in, in Africa as we speak, uh, to deal with Ebola. That wasn't possible a few years ago, so it's saving lives. But essentially, uh, when I look at the reward and the enabling functions, um, when I joined less than four years ago, we were in the 1990s. Um, so my self-inflicted remit was actually to bring us into the, the 21st century, and I think we are there now, and I'm trying to make sure we are in 2020. So. Um, we've doubled in size. The population has an average age of 37 years old. Uh, we are a 67% female uh, organization. Um, and we are dealing with a quest for talent that is very different. Data is very important in the world of science. It's not necessarily well, well, well done. So we are trying to find data scientists as everyone else is. is. <laughs> We are trying to be digital, um, as everyone else is, is trying to, to be as well. Um, and we're also trying to find the best talent so we can be as efficient as possible to deliver our mission. So as everyone else, I guess. So we are, we are trying hard to, to compete and not just rely on purpose to attract people. That, that, you know, in the same way Patagonia is trying to pay people well, we are also trying to do that. And we just cannot rely on you know, improving global health as a mission to, to get people in. They, they, they may come in, but unless they have career progression, unless they can deal with the cost of living of London and so on and so forth, they won't stay, so. So each of you have talked about how much your workforce has changed, growth, doubling in size, expanding, um, making people redundant, a lot of shift. But I know when we spoke before, you, we talked a lot about talent, attracting the right skills, attracting the demographics that you want. What I'd be interested to hear is how have you, what innovative things have you done with your reward and benefits um, strategy specifically to allow you to cope with those changes, be it the way that you're using um, different platforms or technology or um, recognition or experience or what you offer, each one of you is doing something different that's specific to your organization. But I want to get a bit more into the weeds of some of the innovative stuff that you're finding yourself doing to um, deal with the new world order as you're now seeing it. Who would like to... Okay. Yeah, cool. um, I think probably in terms of, I think when we discussed it as, as a call, there were so many things that came up around the attraction of talent and obviously um, whilst Traditionally, it was looking at what was going on with rewards and benefits. I think one of the conversations we got into a lot was around the need to personalise and for that to be relevant to different individuals, no longer necessarily one size fits all. And I think that's probably 
where I'd say we've moved within Conic and Ultra is looking at what, what are our benefits packages and how did we, we decide upon them? And did we decide upon them because our employees wanted those benefits? And actually, when we ask our employees what they think about those benefits, are they actually saying, yes, these are the ones we wanted, or actually were they aligned to a benefits system and package and what was already in existence? And I think we got into a lot of debate about this on the call that we had in preparation for this, but very much I think what's coming out in, in the feedback we're getting is that certainly within my organisation, some of what we're offering isn't necessarily what people want, and actually probably the biggest shift that we saw at um, Conica Minolta, which has gone down brilliantly internally and also has enabled different talent to join us, is having a truly agile and flexible workplace. So being able to offer people true flexibility, that they can work from wherever, however they need to. It's not possible in every part of our organisation yet, and we, we are on a, on a journey, I hate to use the X-factor expression, but we are... But I would say that, honestly, if I was going to pick one thing that works for people in terms of what we offer, it is the flexibility, because that has changed who will come and work for us. I think we're realising something similar. I think we're probably further behind the curve, if I'm honest, um, maybe because of our... Well, you come from a traditional background as well, yeah. but we um, is I think we're... We've relied for a long time on our brands being the thing that's strong enough to pull people and then we didn't really have to work that hard to keep people because once they came they never went gold-plated pensions all the rest of it and we're realizing we're having to work a lot harder now um, to both attract and retain people um, and I would say it, still the prevailing view is if we just throw money at it that will solve it but increasingly that just isn't the case and actually it is that whole workforce experience you know we're bringing in a lot of these new skills but then maybe we're not quite clear how to use them or what the jobs are what the direction is you know it's quite chaotic and I think the, the piece that we're really trying to get hold of is how can we help show what the new career paths might be um, you know how people want to know how they can develop and you know increase their skills and I think that's the area that we've not put enough attention to and really where our efforts trying to go because you've heard everybody's competing for that same talent and yes there are people that will pay more <coughs> but you know that, that you know when when we do our exit interviews it's not the money that is why people are going it's it's that opportunity, it's that clarity of accountability and purpose. So, you know, really, our, I'm almost trying to push it away from a, a pay and benefits discussion into more about, well, if we think about the skills, the way we construct jobs, the teams, the development, the training, almost that needs to come first because I don't think our grading structure, for example, our pay progression is suitable anymore but I don't want to start the discussion based on grading <laughs> and, and pay. I want it to start with the skills and the development paths, and then we can build in behind that. But um, that requires a lot of collaboration um, across, you know, not just the HR function, but the whole business. But that's what I'm trying to push at the moment. I think, Julia, I know you've got some interesting challenge, particularly having a younger workforce and mm. how open they are about their reward and, and things that you are, are keeping you uh, awake at night, shall we say. Uh, so, um, Sky's kind of, from, from the beginning, has had a very open and transparent culture. We have town halls with our exec team every week that's on Zoom and any questions are asked. Uh, I mean, anything from... What shoes the C what trainers the CEO has because he has this fetish about trainers. Um, uh, to what's the strategy to how is the recruitment going for X role, um, and that plays out into reward as well. So there is a desire within the organisation to have a lot of visibility about reward. Um, we get a lot of questions about why we have different benefits in different countries. They don't do cycles of work in Spain. If they did, we would do it. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, we try very hard to have as consistent a uh, benefits framework as possible across all of our locations because of that desire for, for openness and transparency, but also an inbuilt uh, desire for fairness as well. 
Um, but but uh, I'm having conversations with employees at the moment who are taking that to the next level and wanting to share salaries um, broadly across. I know uh, there are tech companies out there who people have done that. Um, uh, but they are wanting to share their salaries because they think that's the fair thing to do to drive uh, a greater pay equity, essentially. So it's, it's an interesting conversation of uh, why, you know, why that might not be a good idea to put salaries on a Slack channel and just dive in. But if employees want to put it on a Slack channel, it's probably going to be on Glassdoor or somewhere anyway that Genie has um, come out of that bottle. Well, exactly. It? I mean, you can go search on LinkedIn, you can search on Glassdoor. Um, and actually, what we found interesting is actually to look at that. When, we're, when we talk to managers, we actually look at Glassdoor and LinkedIn, um, not to use as market data. I can feel the comp people going, what are we doing? <laughs> um, but actually, uh, you know, the managers are looking at that, the employees are looking at that, so we might as well acknowledge that that data is out there in the world. Um, and uh, I always find it interesting because I know what the real data is. Um, so I actually compare what, the, what those uh, open source data sources say versus what I know to the real data to be, and I always find that an interesting exercise. Uh, but I, I do find it, uh, it's important to acknowledge that the openness and transparency of, sa of benefits and, def and salaries is going to own, I can't imagine it getting increasingly transparent, both within companies and between companies. And so I think, I think it's an interesting position to be in from a, a, a compensation point of view. Yeah. JC, I want to, um, I mean, that's a very, sorry, I'm just going on. That's actually a huge topic and we could probably spend a whole day discussing that. <laughs> so I don't want to just dismiss it. But I'm also keeping an eye on the time and I think that's one I want to come back to as Reba over the coming year because you're probably all facing that in one way or another. Um, JC, going across to Slido, a question comes up and it's probably going to be that question that you were going to answer at this point. So um, somebody's asked, what kind of 90s reward practice did you bring into the 21st century? <laughs> So, um, my predecessor left the week before I arrived, which was really kind of him, in the middle of a peer review. And um, <laughs> he, he left me with a pile of paper. I thought, this is a brilliant uh, handover, you know, very detailed. It turns out they were all benefits forms, <laughs> stacked like that. He also had left a calculator with the, the, the four key broken. So clearly he was always <laughs> touching that. And it was a Kit Kat as well, which was very nice. Um, so I thought, well, this is interesting. How much time, and this, the, the salary review was all done on spreadsheets and emails, and the spreadsheets were not even locked. So managers in part of the organization were editing data as they were and moving data around, which was really interesting as well. So uh, that's the sort of 90s I'm, I'm talking about. And I thought, okay, um, how much time are we spending in each area, so comp benefit? And clearly, it was, it was uh, the benefit side that was so manual, so paper-driven that it was, and so, therefore, prone to errors, you know. We were using this lovely, uh, you may have seen them sometimes in documentaries, um, envelopes, you know, uh, wrench envelopes that goes around buildings and sometimes make their way to the right uh, person or not. <laughs> and so uh, we don't have those anymore. You know, we've, uh, there is one of the providers out there just, just outside who um, we started to, uh, well, we used to implement a, a benefit portal. So all that is now uh, out, uh, people can go, you know, on their mobile, can go on the on the portal, and it's it's connected to uh, Workday, which we impl implemented a few a few months ago, and so on. So you know, in terms of comp, in terms of um, in terms of benefit, in terms of comp, we're going to have advanced comp uh, coming up in the next few months. So all that has has, has changed quite uh, radically. And uh, just coming back on asking people to the absolutely right, you know. You can make a lot of assumptions, and I work with a lot of scientists who hate assumptions. So um, <laughs> I thought, okay, what is it that these 700 people want from, from reward in 2016 when I joined? So the technology we had was abysmal, but I, I found some um, um, videos on, on YouTube about how to use Qualtrics, and I did a Qualtrics survey, and that was really interesting, and 65% of the organization responded to it, and it was about comp, it was about benefits, it was the benefits they were aware of, uh, what they 
thought of the benefits, when they were aware of them and their experience. And um, um, that was an amazing platform then to go back to my you know, uh, executive team and to say, well, actually, you know, really, we, we need to, to go further from the 90s. And we had a pay structure which was designed in 94. It was a great year for pay structure, uh, fantastic um, season. But uh, it was a bit outdated. It was probably fit for purpose for welcome with 200 people in one building at the time, very insular, very UK-centric. But it wasn't right for us. So it has given us the, um, the mandate to bring everything back. So the pay structure, we are in the middle of you know, uh, implementing, um, implementing it now. And that's the foundational thing. You know, I don't think you can respond to go to the theme of the um, panel. You know, I don't think you can respond to demand in the future that is evolving if you don't have foundations that give you the ability to start shifting and moving things around, particularly in benefits. You know, it's, uh, if you don't have a, a tool that gives you data quickly to respond to, to shift, you, you cannot o operate. So it's, um, and I still have the calculator. Uh, to, to be fair, I still keep checking a few things, yeah. but um, yeah. But we'll get on to, to well to add to that. I think it's about having a scale, having scalability. Yeah. So it's exactly. putting in place infrastructure that will allow you to scale to continue to double in headcount. Mm -hmm. And, exactly and that. so that's that's what I found. <laughs> Gemma, a question's come through for, I can see for you. You can it's see that. Can't you? It's got your name on it. So. <laughs> and I think it's a really good one. And. Um, so what do we do for employees uh, who can't work flexibly in their role? Well, interestingly, the first point I'd make is that we had quite a funny conversation when we first looked at having a much more flexible setup, where I spoke to quite a lot of managers uh, with business partners, and first of all, I was told that one of the managers in this example didn't mind his people working flexibly at all, but only on Mondays and Tuesdays. <laughs> so I think one of the big things I'd point out is that a lot of people think their employees can't work flexibly because they don't want them to, they don't trust them, and they won't take the time to workforce plan, think about how they do it, and actually bring that in. And I would say that that's been our biggest challenge. There's very few roles where it isn't possible, and where it isn't possible in the way of you can work anywhere from a coffee shop to your home, we have um, changed patterns so that people in the warehouse, our workshop, in our um, call centre type environment, can work different shifts, as someone's asked in there, because that wasn't even in. That was literally, you came in at this time and you left at that time, despite the fact that there could be all different variances to that. And interestingly, in our warehouse particularly, which is a, a natural environment that's slightly more union-like traditionally, there was real pushback when we discussed and consulted with changing hours. And then there was just one guy who was one of the strongest voices in that team with actually that means I could drop my children at school and actually that suits my wife's job better and actually that would be completely different. And so we started to, to change that thinking. So we've looked at it across all different types of roles, but one thing I did note throughout that process and so did a lot of my colleagues, that the resistance came from control and trust more than anything to do with it not being possible to serve customer need. So it's a lot of its behaviour and there needs to be some discussion around that to really face into that, I think. I want to come back to the theme about transparency around pay and reward. There's a few questions coming through that are linked to that. So um, the main question is, how is your business responding to the trend or demand for greater transparency around pay and reward? But uh, there's another question, what are you doing about pay gaps? I think that comes under that transparency. And somebody else has asked, are you reviewing your ethnicity gaps? So perhaps we can talk about transparency, fairness, um, BAME reporting, gender pay reporting, and perhaps get a, a, an answer from, a quick answer from each of you on those. Who wants to kick off on that one? JC. I think my, my principle is, is uh, I, I, there was something in the, in the 80s in Russia called Glasnost, which is you know, bringing transparency to Russia. I did very well for them at the time. And um, it, um, my view is that if you, if, if you are not transparent, somebody will be for you. But it's a question of scale and readiness. So yes, people are exchanging. We have Slack. And I know that there are things being bandied around, et cetera. But um, for us, it's having a view that um, it's being able to explain why people are paid in a certain fashion. And I think with the one of the issues that was very clear in that survey I mentioned is that there were inconsistencies. And there was a perceived sense of unfairness across the organization. So we looked into that. And we realized that you know, the divisions had gone a bit, um, 
rogue in some areas and they were you know, not following the rules. Um, there was a scientific area that had developed an algorithm to calculate bonuses, because why not? And uh, they were apply implementing it only for their area. And that was creating issues across the organization. So we first had to bring the level of consistency up across all the organization. And with the pay structure work that we are doing, we hope that we can actually be able to be a lot more solid in the decisions we, we make and the processes <laughs> we've, we've developed around that and the data we've gathered as well um, will help us explain things. There is a demand. Uh, the first time we release our gender pay gap uh, data internally, our Trustnet, uh, Trustnet, which is our intranet award winning, um, got broken almost. We, we went, uh, it was going down to the, to the right every time. There were comments to comments to comments and we were at a thread that was about that, that thing. And it's, people wanted to have as much information as possible. And they are scientists, so they wanted me to give them our information so they could verify that it was actually the right calculations. <laughs> Why not? So there's a slight issue around confidentiality, possibly, maybe, maybe there. Um, but we've, we've, we know there is a demand, and we are trying to answer it at the pace. We are comfortable answering it as well. Uh, and we also know that we just cannot release all the information freely like that. Because I think it, uh, in some individuals may not want it to be released as well. And that's another um, uh, issue. We've released our ethnicity pay gap data for the first time a couple of uh, couple of months ago as, as well, and that's our path, uh, and we will try to, to stick to it, but at a pace that is as comfortable for us as as possible. Anybody else on the panel want to take that, and then I'm going to move on to some more questions because we've got a lot of questions coming through. And, and do a couple of bits. Um, yeah. One is we had the same experience about gender pay gap. The first year we did it internally got a whole load of questions second year, we were like, you know what, we're just going to give you a whole load of data. And so we did, I think I did about 10 pages of backup data of all the sort of different cuts, put it on the intranet, silence. Yeah. Silence. That was wonderful. It was truly wonderful. Um, uh, so on the, on the sort of the, the pay transparency, we actually, about 18 months ago, removed any discretion from managers in the comp cycle. Um, they can request a, a review, but we, we basically took a, a lot of the, we got, I got challenged to use some AI. And I was like, well, I can't find any vendor out there that does that, so we're gonna build it ourselves. And so we took a lot of the analysis that we do, built a spreadsheet calculator that did it, put it into our online tool, and basically said to, to managers, it's not the same sort of algorithm you guys write, and, and knowledge, but we actually took them through what the, what the algorithm that we built would do. So here's a merit increase, here's, here's how we look at it, here's the analysis, here's what's going to be the output. Um, and we're taking away your discretion, by the way. We're, we're still going to give you the opportunity to ask us to look at it in more detail, because there's always something that you can't code for. Um, but we're essentially taking away your, your, in, your inputs. Um, but here's what we're going to do. And again, we had very, we did a, we did manager training for everybody, talked them through what it was, gave them, uh, not exactly the formula, but gave them the sort of, the, the principles that worked. And actually we've heard nothing from it because, and part of that is that sort of concept of fairness. And we're saying we're doing it because we want to take out bias. We've, we've written the code, we're going to apply it to everybody. You give the performance, we'll, we'll end up with the comp. And actually it's, um, it's really, uh, I think, helped that fairness gene that, that a lot of our employees have. Just one thing I wanted to add as well, and with this year we took a decision to advertise every job with the salary. So it's, you know, by the power of deduction, you, you can start understanding who is paid how much in the organization. So, and we have to release, because of the charity commission requirements, we have to release also some data as well. So people, if they really want, they can actually start putting some pieces to, together. So. But at least we are comfortable knowing that if we, really, if we have a job advertised, we are paying it according to a, a policy and a principle that we are comfortable with and we can explain uh, to employees, whereas two years ago, I don't think we would have been I able think, to do. I think an important part as well, right, transparency is, is a start, but the, the, the point is also about the action, isn't it? I know probably for both of us with a more traditional bracket, so the male to female ratio in the UK, 25% female in, in the organization, 15% globally for Conoco Minolta. So not surprisingly, the pay gap 
gender pay gap not great. Um, in which case, I think it's about what you also do. So as an example, the reason for that in our organisation is sales-driven service, high level of service community, so engineers. So predominantly male, both in sales and service, in which case that impacts that number. And we've, we've looked at recruitment strategies, what we're doing in terms of wording and job advertising. So how do we get that talent pool to look different? Because without changing some of those more complex things that are where, why we are where we are, then the data each year will stay the same. Um, it, that, that's also, I think, quite important in that discussion, mm -hmm. is that there's a lot of data and transparency, but it's about what do you do once you know in order to change it. And I think sometimes positive steps can actually make your gender pay gap worse. Mm. So for us, our gender pay gap got not massively, but slightly worse from the first to the second year because we'd hired a lot of um, females in sort of early careers. So if you're, you know, because it, it, again, there aren't loads of automotive engineers at senior levels out there. So, you know, our efforts are all about kind of bringing people in and, and sort of developing them. But if you have an influx of people at sort of early stages in their careers, that actually makes your gender pay get worse. So again, our focus has been much more about our diversity and inclusion agenda and, and yeah. the positive steps we want to take there, regardless of the gender pay gap. Because if we followed that, we'd do some really so it's all things. about your narrative and explaining yeah. what you're doing, why you're doing this, so people yeah. understand yeah. it, yeah. it's transparent, and they go, that yeah. makes sense yeah. for the so long it's, term. Yeah, it's back to do the right thing, not mm. sort of, you know, make it yeah. look good, yes. because that's yeah. not the point. Yeah. I want to go on to another question that's proving popular on here, and are there any traditional benefits you would see disappearing or you've already removed? So it might be that you don't want to sit in a public forum and announce that you're about to scrap a certain <laughs> benefit for your staff, given that that might get out of the room. But just broadly, as reward professionals, what do you think we might see um, disappearing? And of course, if you have removed it already, then there's no, <laughs> no secret that you might want to keep. Anything that might go? I've seen lots of puzzled faces. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure that it's about the benefits disappearing. I think if you look at the traditional benefits, people have this urge to you know, be prepared for the future financially, to, to have their health uh, in good stead, uh, whether it's the physical, mental, emotional health, and so on and so forth. So I don't think that's necessarily the, the core disappearing. I think it's the way it's delivered that is, that is going to change. And I want to pick up on that one, because the call yeah. that we had, I'm looking at Julia now, she knows exactly what I'm going to say, <laughs> is we started talking about insurances, group insurances, mm -hmm. and whether group insurances, the way they, they're currently offered by the big providers, as much as we love them very much, um, are they fit for purpose for mm -hmm. a future workforce? Julia, perhaps you can explain some of the challenges that you found with um, group insurances at the moment. Yeah, so, uh, so we ask our employees what we think as well, and I think one of the things that, that we have, so we have you know, 65 nationalities and a uh, you know, young workforce, and the, there is a desire to, for example, uh, insure parents on private medical a lot. Um, and that's not something I necessarily saw 10 years ago. Um, but it's certainly something that uh, is increasingly being requested. From the obviously non-traditional family family styles are or not all of the benefits that are have been in place for the last fifty years um, are set up for that sort of structure. And so I think what we what we've been doing uh, over the past year is. You know, is broadening the definition of family where we can throughout all of our benefits mm -hmm. and all of our locations. Um, but still, I think there's a lot of change coming, I would hope, within the insurances, particularly for families, particularly for uh, extended, um, extended relationships in terms of, of the need for support, looking at the, the people that, you know, or employees have to support from an emotional point of view as well as a caring point of view. And I know, having spoken to a few of the insurers in the market, they're looking a lot more at women's well-being and how yeah. many exclusions go against mm -hmm. claims linked to menopause or fertility, which discriminate against women in the workplace compared to mm -hmm. men where it's the default. 
So might not be there yet, but it's a conversation that's been had with the big players um, quite a lot, and, and we'll be following it very closely as Reba as well. So won't disappear, but needs to adapt for the future. Mm. Right, probably got time for one more question. We need to go on the offline employees. Okay, let's done, go on offline. Done, Thank you. Number, it's got nine people <laughs> on it. I mean, we've done quite a lot on this recently. Obviously, our production operators, those on the sort of the, the production line, don't have um, access to um, company IT, and it's been a long-running sore for us, um, which kind of gets to that them and us sort of blue and white collar. Um, but also, I mean, what what really brought it to a head was when the um, I think the water company turned off um, our water and Solly Hull. We had to send everybody home, and then we got no way to tell people that it was back on and could you come back to work, please? <laughs> um, and, um, and that kind of got management attention finally. But um, so we've done two things. Um, number one was we've actually asked people for their personal email addresses, um, and we now have 95% of them. People have given them to us. Um, and we're obviously very careful at you know, not bombarding people with communication, um, but, we, but that's proved quite effective in terms of just simple, you know, normal newsletter type communication, but also you know, the types of um, communications we do around our pay negotiations. You know, in my earlier days, you'd be there with sort of boxes full of bulletins that needed to be there at six in the morning, all of those things. We just do by email now and have saved, you know, thousands of pounds um, on just simple things like that. And then the other thing we've done is we launched uh, Your JLR app um, earlier this year, which we did as a very low budget approach, started simple and we've gradually built on it. We've done it outside the firewall because it was all of that single sign on that was proving so costly and complex. Um, so obviously there's a limit to the information we can have there because you could all go onto it if you, you, know, you chose to. Um, but that has proved so um, powerful in terms of connecting people with, with information. Um, we've put you know, information about employee discounts on there. We've had competitions to drive access to it. You know, the recent the Lego Defender, which is just so cool. You know, the, we had about sort of, you know, I, I'm not sure what it was, 9,000 people entering that competition. So we've had 29,000 downloads in total. Um, we've just recently put payslip access on there, so obviously that drives a lot of traffic. Um, we've got information um, about our EAP, um, our car programmes, all sorts of things on there. But it's just, I mean, I'd go back to what Matthew Taylor said this morning, that sense of connectedness, feeling part of something, it's had really powerful impacts in terms of just general engagement and feeling part of something rather special, so it's been... I mean, we're still building on it. There's a long way to go. We'd like it to be more two-way, but it's been really powerful, very powerful. Thank you, Jane. I'm going to draw the panel to a close now because, um, well, I mean, we could be here all day, couldn't we? So at some point, we've got to stop. So could you give all four of our panelists a very big round of applause?